Good morning. I'm Pastor Chris Nunley. And I'm Pastor Allison Yankee. And we're from Covenant United Methodist Church. And we're welcoming you this morning to this very special virtual worship experience from our tapestry churches. We are so excited that you are joining us for worship today. Quick reminder for you, normally on the first Sunday, United Methodist Churches tend to celebrate communion. We're going to be doing that next week as we gather with each of our home churches. So you can make a plan for that. Yeah, just check with your local church as to how they're going to be managing that. But we're just grateful that you're here for this special experience. Uh, And so we just say welcome this morning and prepare for a blessing as we worship together. So watch this introduction to Tapestry Churches and we'll see you in worship. Hey everyone, we're here to tell you about a new initiative and we are all about not being alone together. Yeah, it's about embracing unity beyond just church names and locations. I'm Ron Barton of First Auburn United Methodist Church. I'm Nikki Brown Rice of Good Shepherd United Methodist Church. And I'm David Abbott at Trinity United Methodist and The Taper. I'm Jason Morris with First Wayne Street United Methodist Church. And I'm Allison Yankee at Covenant United Methodist Church. We're tapping into the power of connectionalism through the United Methodist Church. By partnering and pooling our resources, we can do so much more together to witness and build the kingdom of God. The church truly is the hope of the world, and together, we're amplifying that hope. We're reimagining the future, and we're doing it together in strength and in joy. We're in a season of exploring new approaches, building on what works while staying true to our faith. Our goal? It's to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to transform the world, guided by grace and faithfulness. God's doing a new thing. And we're part of it. So let's move forward. In faith. Together. It's so good to be with you all this morning worshiping. We trust in Jesus. We take him at his word. So let's sing. Is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide. You're good on your promise. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe. I'll sing how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your word. You spoke, and the chaos fell in the I know, cause I've seen it in my life. It's a narrow road that leads to life, and I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, and the tide is high, but you're part of the water. I'll take you at your word If you said it, I believe I've seen how good it works If you start it, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word If you said it, I believe I've seen how good it works So we sing, you said your love would never give up, you said your grace is always enough, you said your heart would never forget or forsake me. You said I'm saved, you call 
Thank you for the words that you give us to sing and to lift up to you. Lord, we know that uh, the reason we come to seek you is because we know who you are. And it gives us that inspiration. It gives us that, that ability to reach out to you in worship. So we sing of who you are this morning. And we thank you for who you are, to our families and, and those that surround us. In your name, amen. Let's sing this together and thank him this morning. A treasure of greatest price and healer giving me life and faithful again and again is your Jesus, your love never ends. Yeah. Oh, you never failed us, Lord. And sovereign, and all that you do.
join us for our call to worship. Children of God, welcome. Welcome to this place of love and grace. Welcome to this place of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to be a part of the beloved community. God invites all of us to share in the good news. We are welcome just as we are. We are loved just as we are. In gratitude for all of this, let us worship God. Opening prayer today, I want to read to you a Franciscan benediction. May God bless you with discomfort and easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we now turn our attention in our worship to prayer time, uh, I want you all to know that this is the segment where you can record your prayer requests, whether you do that online through your church's normal platform, or you just wanna grab a pen and paper and write these prayer requests you have down in front of you to hold onto throughout this entire sec section of our worship. Um, we will be guided by a prayerful song and then enter into a more pastoral prayer time and the Lord's Prayer after that. But please now take time to think of your prayer requests, your joys and concerns, and record those in whatever way feels right for you in this moment.
As we prepare for prayer this morning, we'll have a time of silence to center ourselves and quiet our hearts and minds, followed by a pastoral prayer, and then we'll pause for a moment to light a candle. So here at Good Shepherd, we have this practice of taking a, a moment every Sunday to stop and light candles for those we care about, whether in gratitude or concern, issues and things that are of importance to us. So today, as you are watching from home or wherever you are gathered, feel free to find a candle or take a moment of reflection um, to celebrate and pray for those places and people that are on your heart. And then we will close together with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, giver of every good gift, we, we thank you for who you are, for the ways you show yourself to us and, and shower us with your love, your compassion, and your mercy. We thank you for the ways that you are present and move in and around our lives, through our lives, through the conversations we may have with our family and friends and also strangers. And this morning, God, we ask that as we pause, as we recognize this, this Labor Day weekend, this, this day when we try to focus on rest, Right now, as we pause, we, we pray that we would be reminded that we find our rest in you. And sometimes rest doesn't mean that all activity and everything stops and that we don't have responsibilities and things to think about and things to do, but we pray in this time of worship, in this moment of prayer together now with you, that we could lay down our concerns offer ourselves as fully to you as possible to your love that embraces us and welcomes us and calls us always. We pray that we could offer ourselves and remember that you carry these things with us and we are not alone. And this morning for, for the places in our lives, in our communities, in our world where there is hurt, where we are worried, frustrated, angry when there is brokenness or where there is brokenness that needs healing, we ask God for that healing. May your Holy Spirit move in mysterious and miraculous ways and through our own hands and feet to be healing and to be hope and love in the ways that, that we can be. We pray for those who are dealing with significant health issues, whether that's looking forward to a surgery or recovering from one. Maybe we are dealing with, and those that we love are dealing with serious illnesses and diagnoses. Perhaps the hurt and heaviness we are feeling is grief of a loss or a broken relationship. Maybe it's the change of a job or or a big move that's looming, perhaps our own mental health or that of someone that we love is a hardship and we pray, God, for your help, that we would remember that you are with us and you are also with those that we care for in everything that we offer and you would bring healing in whatever way it can come. We thank you for the places that our lives are overflowing with joy. Maybe that's with new grandbabies or hitting new milestones in our lives and our work. Maybe it's a new um, endeavor that's coming to be, a dream that's coming true. We pray that we would remember to be grateful and to share those joys in ways that are sustainable and encouraging to one another, that we may build each other up in our strengths and in our weaknesses, because that is the kingdom of God. And that is who you call us to be. That's who you've created us to be as disciples and as your church, to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in all the ways we can, for as many as we can, for as ever as long that we can. And we pray all this. We pray that we would be a blessing to you as we leave this time of worship today through being edified by song and prayer and your word proclaimed, we pray that we would leave transformed by your grace to be your church, to be your people. 
for the transformation of the world. We pray all this in Christ's mighty name. Amen. Let us pray now as our Lord has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, no matter what we say or do, this is what we think of you. Kind of a harsh prayer, isn't it? It is a prayer that is shared in retired United Methodist pastor, bishop, and theologian Will Willimon's book on offerings. And in the book, he shared that a pastor under his care would offer this prayer during worship. Kind of a strong prayer, don't you think? But it does remind us, it does call to us that we are meant to trust in God and that bringing in the tithe, bringing in the full portion that God has asked of us, is not only for the benefit of the church and the building of the kingdom, but for the benefit of our own soul. Do we trust him? Do we consider his will and his mandates to be something that will be a blessing to us when followed in the full? So as you consider giving to your church, consider also, do you trust in the Lord? Do you believe that he will provide for you if you do follow his mandates, if you do follow his commands? In the book of Malachi, the prophet encourages the people to bring in the full tithe and to experience the blessings that the Lord will pour out from the heavens. Let's pray. Lord, we are here because you have called us to be here. We thank you for the blessing of being your people and for the blessing of being able to uh, provide financially for the building of your kingdom. We know there are those who are giving out of abundance. We know there are those who are giving out of the widow's might. And Lord, why the blessing may be harsh, may it be difficult to hear, Lord. No matter what we say or do, this is what we think of you. I pray, Lord, that for those of us who are growing in faith, that we would hear those words not as a condemnation, but as encouragement to trust in you and to find the blessings that come from following you, your mandates, and investing in your kingdom. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.
our prayer of thanksgiving. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit that we may know Christ and make him known. And through him at all times and in all places may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Good morning, kiddos. I want you to get super, super close to your screen, like so close that your parents would get mad if it wasn't for church. Okay, maybe a little too close. Back up just a little bit. There you go. Perfect. Okay, so take a second and think about your best friend. Yep, I bet you're smiling right now. Think about your best friend, how nice and how loving they are and how easy they make it for you to love them and to be nice to them. Okay, now think about that one person that's not so nice. That, you know, you just, it's really hard to show them that love and that kindness because maybe they hurt someone or they're kind of mean. You know, it's really hard to love them, isn't it? And maybe sometimes you don't want to. Why don't we see what Jesus has to say about that? Jesus was teaching a large crowd on the mountainside. He said, you might have heard that we should be nice to people who are nice to us and mean to people who are mean to us. But that's not what I want you to do. I want you to be loving and kind to all people even people who are mean to you. God loves everyone, so we also must show love to everyone. Seems a little easier said than done, right? So how do we do that? Let's see what else they have to say. Paul wrote a letter to people who lived in Rome and followed Jesus. The letter said, show love to each other, respect each other, Show your excitement while you serve each other and God. Be happy, stand your ground, and pray often. Share what you have with others, and be welcoming to new people. Be nice to all people, even if they aren't very nice to you. Be happy with happy people, and sad with sad people. Remember that everyone is equal. No one is better than anyone else. Try to always live peacefully, with all people. So as that told us, God loves everyone. God loves your best friend, and God also loves that not so nice person, the one that's hard to love. But the most important thing that you need to remember is that when it says God loves everyone, that includes you. God loves you for who you are right now, but he also loves you for who you're going to be when you grow up. And all he wants is to show you that love. And then he wants us to show other people that love too. So let me leave you with a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of a job. I want you to find one person, maybe it's the person you thought of before, maybe not, one person that's not so nice and is really hard to love sometimes. Show them that love. Smile at them, play with them, share with them. Just one person, one time. Can you do that for me? All right, you guys bow your heads and fold your hands with me so we can pray. And I'm gonna say a few words and then I'm gonna give you guys a second to repeat back to me, all right? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving everyone. Help me remember to love everyone too. 
Thank you for this day. Amen. Today's prayer of illumination. Father, stir such a passion in my heart that words cannot describe the adoration I will have for you. Give me a revelation of just how much you love me. Remind me of the times and ways you have pursued me. Increase my desire to pursue you. Ignite the red hot fires of your love and unconditional acceptance in my heart so I will be changed forever. Kiss me with the kisses of your word. Soften my heart. Liberate me. Bring me into an unfolding understanding of your heart and your passion for me. Father, I want to know who you really are. Reveal yourself to me. Warm my heart with your spirit and make me more like your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So friends, I have two scripture readings I'd like to share with you today. The first one is from the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 44. And those of you over 60 will clearly forgive me for these. Those under, someday you'll understand. So the first reading from Daniel 2, beginning in verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron and bronze and clay and silver and gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Our other scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. And if you're following along in your Bible, when I stop, if you want to go on to the next parable, that would be good too. We're going to talk a little bit about it. This is from Mark 4, beginning in verse 26. It's the parable of the growing seed. Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
So thank you for allowing me to come and, and be your preacher for the day in whatever form that takes, takes itself. Um, and also thank you for giving your pastor an opportunity to have a weekend of renewal. That's kind and generous of you, and I, I want you to know I really appreciate it. So what I want to talk to us about today on this Labor Day weekend is, is what is our work? What is our labor? What is it that we're supposed to do? Now, many of you know from uh, my story that I spent many years as a bricklayer. Um, and um, that, that was a wonderful profession. And it was kind of our family trade. My dad, when I, when I left bricklaying to become a, a pastor, one of the few pieces of advice he gave me um, was don't sell your tools. Now, um, I'm not exactly sure what he meant by that, but I think he meant that I needed a backup plan just in case. Now, I can't remember if he'd heard me preach yet or not at that point, but that might explain it. So I listened to him, and I kept my tools, and I brought some uh, to talk with you about today. So this is a trowel. Bricklayers use this. Now, of course, in southern Indiana, where I grew up and worked, um, we didn't call this a trowel. It was pronounced more like trial. So this was the thing that we used to, to spread mortar, which is the, the material between bricks and blocks, and uh, it's, it's an essential tool. It's an essential tool of that work. Also, the brick hammer. Now, you can see the brick hammer is different than most hammers. It is uniquely designed for the maximum ability to crush thumbs and it works, believe me. It has this little end on it that you can kind of uh, make uh, rough cuts on blocks and brick, um, and it, this is an essential tool for that work. Next, I brought this tool, which uh, some of you maybe have never seen before. Looks kind of interesting, doesn't it? So this is called a jointer, um, and this is used in between the bricks and blocks to sort of finish out the, uh, the mortar, you saw while it's still kind of um, um, able to make an impression on it, you use this to kind of make it smooth between the bricks and blocks. This is an essential tool for that work. Lastly, I brought this, string. Now, string is used to help uh, your blocks and brick stay straight. You establish point A and point B, you stretch a string between it, and you lay your bricks or blocks to that line so that it's straight all the way across. This is an essential tool of that work. Now, as you can see, I listened to my dad, I didn't sell my tools, so you, if this goes really poorly, let me know and I may have to kind of shine them up a little bit and be ready to use them again. So. What I want us to think about is what's our work, and then in turn, what, what are our essential tools in that work? Now, the, um, the parable in, in uh, Mark 4 that we're talking about today begins with, this, with these words, the kingdom of God is like. Now, Jesus uses that phrase a lot, the kingdom of God is like. And this time, it's like a seed that was sown. Many years ago, I served a church that was primarily uh, agriculture. In fact, about 70% of the people in that church drew their primary income from some type of agriculture or ag business. Um, and I learned a lot there. One of the farmers, um, he used to tell me, now this was before the lottery or casinos were legal in Indiana, and he used to tell me that um, farming was the only uh, legalized gambling in Indiana. Because he said there's so many factors that you can't control, that you have no control over. And then he had a line that I've always held on to. He used to say, not a single farmer can grow a single grain. Only God can. See, their work was to plant and to nurture and to tend but God is the one that did the growing. The kingdom of God is like that. Now, as we think about the kingdom of God, uh, one of the things that I think is important is to think about the fact that the kingdom of God is sort of already and not yet. 
So we are living in a time after Christ has come when Christ has called us to try to live into the kingdom of God. So there are glimpses of the kingdom of God all around us all the time. But it's not fully here. It will come, there'll come a day in Revelation, in fact, uh, anytime you're confused about something, just go to Revelation. It'll either solve it or make you feel better about what you were confused about. So Revelation 17 is the, is the passage that talks about the trumpets. And when the seventh trumpet is blown in verse 15, then we see, we hear that, that the, the kingdom of God will one day come on earth. In Revelation 20, we read more about that, that it will be a place of no more tears, no more death, no more pain. And so we know that the kingdom of God that's, that's here, that we see glimpses of, will also come in completion at a later time. And that's kind of where the reading from Daniel comes in. Now remember, Daniel is a book that was written during the Babylonian exile uh, that, that began in 567 B.C., um, the Babylonian Empire was one of the four great empires of the world at that time, so it was a big deal. And um, in that time, dreams were so important. They believed that dreams were one of the ways that the gods uh, communicated with them. And so when Nebuchadnezzar has this dream that upsets him, he's looking for interpreters. And none of his interpreters or seers uh, could interpret the dream. But Daniel, the Jew, the exile, could. And now let's remember together kind of what that was all about. So the dream he had, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, was of a statue that was made of the four um, valuable metals of the time, of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and then the feet were clay. And in the dream, um, a huge boulder was carved out of a mountain, and it says, not by human hands, so by God. And it comes to the statue, and it destroys it. So Daniel said that this, this image that you've had in this dream, this, this is what's going to happen. That there will come a time when the kingdom of God will rule the earth, and the kingdoms of the earth will pass away. Now, a lot of people think those four metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, sort of refer to the four great kingdoms of that time, of Babylonia, Persia, e, um, Greece, and Rome. In other words, he's saying that all of the great empires, every great empire will one day pass away. That the only eternal kingdom is the kingdom of God. And if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar has this amazing response to this. He, he um, set, falls on his knees or falls prostrate before Daniel and gives him incense and honors him. But then he says things like this, Surely your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings. See, when people get a glimpse of the kingdom of God, start to understand how big, powerful, and loving God really is. The kingdom of God sort of already and not yet. Our work is connected to that. Our work is a part of the kingdom of God. Now Mark 4, remember it starts, the kingdom of God is like. Um, and then there's two parables. One about the planting of the seed. The second one that I didn't read, but you... you feel free to go ahead, uh, is the parable of the mustard seed. And we'll talk just a bit about that in a minute. And they, they, the parable of the sower, or the parable of the seed that's planted, sort of illustrates this cooperative relationship between the planter and God. That the planter is responsible for planting the seed, but God is the one that grows it. I think about my friend, the farmer, right? Only God can grow a seed. Um, but God does what God does. And I might say it better. God does what only God can do. Our work is to prepare. God's work is to complete. So our work, friends, I would suggest sort of focuses around three things. To plant, to tend, and to nurture. And our primary tools for those three things are these four things. Faith, 
humility, hope, and love. So if our, if our work is to plant seeds of the kingdom of God, then our faith becomes the initiating point, right? Why can we talk about the kingdom of God? Because we've seen glimpses of it. We recognize it. We, we long for it. We, we know for certain that it will come. In fact, um, tonight at, um, at 8.12, something will happen. I guarantee you. Can you guess? The sun will set at 8.12 tonight on the Sunday before Labor Day, September 1st, it's 8-12. But it hadn't happened yet. So is it already or not yet, or both? In other words, we can have the certainty of the kingdom of God just like we have the certainty that at 8-12 tonight the sun will set because we know that God is faithful. So when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a, a seed that's planted, we can have certainty that God will be at work. Now, let's talk about how they planted, because I think this is really key when we think about planting, tending, and nurturing. So, in the ancient Near East, the way a farmer would tend to plant seeds is sometimes they would broadcast them, just scatter them. Um, but most of the time, they would use um, a, a wooden implement to either push or drill a hole in the soil, and then they would drop a seed in, then cover that seed up, and then they would repeat that again and again and again and again. So why not use today's farming methods for an illustration where you know, massive amounts of seeds could be planted in, in shorter times than ever? Well, because I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind. I think Jesus had in mind that the kingdom of God will grow with each individual act of love, a seed planted. Each moment when, when we, we say to somebody, you know, I see in you, I see in you the, the, the love of Christ. And the plant is, is tended. And when we say to someone, I, I understand or I seek to understand where you've been. And the seed is nurtured. You see, I think Jesus calls us to build the kingdom one seed, one person, one moment at a time. And then having done our work, then we trust that God will do what only God can do. So we use those primary tools of our faith, our humility, right? We don't come to someone else to talk about the kingdom of God to say, you know what, we've got it all sewn up, we got it all together, and let us share, let me share with you how that needs to happen for you. We come at it with humility. This is how I found. This is what I've experienced. We don't talk down. We don't treat people poor. We have humility that we are simply the planters of seeds. And God will do what God can do. Hope. The world longs. The world cries out. The world is desperate for hope. And we have a hope that stretches beyond this life and beyond this world, beyond this kingdom. And that's a message that people want to hear. That's a primary tool. And then finally, love. There, there's nothing more powerful than love. King talked about it, that hate is too great a burden to bear. Love is the most powerful thing we can share. So we take our, we take our basic tools right? Our primary tools, our essential tools for the work that God calls us to. And we go about it. We go about our work. Now remember I said I'd talk just a little bit about the parable of the mustard seed, so it's very little. But I, every time I read that, pa that passage about the parable of the mustard seed, I think about sort of my experiences. Because he said the kingdom of God is kind of like a mustard seed. Well, when I grew up, where I grew up in southern Indiana, mustard seed or mustard plants weren't these giant things that grew into something like a tree. They were weeds. They were weeds, and, and sometimes they're called goldenrod, but they're beautiful weeds. <laughs> they, um, you, you, you'll, see, you'll see whole fields before the farmers plant, 
you'll see whole fields that are turned golden through these mustard plants, this beautiful yellow. But it's also a weed, so it's invasive. It's in its nature to spread. So while he didn't, I wonder what it would have been like if Jesus would have said the kingdom of God is like a weed. A weed that, that, that is invasive. It gets into people's lives. It gets into the world and changes it. That its nature is to grow, expand. What if the kingdom of God was like a weed? And our role was to plant and tend and nurture. We come to this season of fall and we'll see harvest going on in the fields around us. And we'll see the seasons change, the leaves will change. And we'll be, we'll be reminded of the temporary nature of life itself. And in that moment, here's my hope, that we'll remember that it is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God alone that is eternal among the kingdoms, divinely wrought, brought about, and eternal. A kingdom that is here among us and we see glimpses of and a kingdom that's not yet coming, coming to us as certain as the sun will set. So friends, our work is to plant and tend and nurture one person, one life, one act of love at a time. And then it is to trust God to do what only God can do. For we are the workers and God is God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you call us to do. And we thank you, O oh God, for the call of work. May we indeed step into your work for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
on behalf of the clergy and staff of the churches making up the Tapestry Collective, I want to thank you for joining us for this special virtual worship service. We are looking forward to future opportunities across the collective to worship, grow, and serve together. May the God of joy fill our hearts with gladness as we celebrate the unity of our faith. As we go forth from this time, may the hope of Christ inspire us to shine his light in our communities and beyond. Let us remember that we are better together, bound by Christ's love and grace. So may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May the joy of the Lord be our strength now and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.